Okay, it's 9.30. Uh, I, I want to make things clear here. If you miss a class, you don't need to send me an email, okay? Because I trust that you are all adults, so I'm sure that if you miss a class, you have good reason for that. So you don't need to send me an email. Okay, I'm not going to penalize you because you are missing a class. I think it's better to be in person, but, you know, things can happen. So if you are missing a class, don't send me an email because it's like 50... Uh, in each class so you know I, I just told you that if you have a very good attendance like 90 percent and above then i will give you extra credit but i understand that some some cases you know you you, you can miss a class you know i'm, I'm not, i won't be mad i'm not going to track you down so don't send me an email <laughs> and then okay i just want to go back to oh I'm working on your first assignment, so almost done. And good news for this for, for the first assignment that I will assign. If you go to the share folder here in Dropbox, you're gonna find uh, here that will be my lectures. And here in that folder, I'm gonna put the tutorials for the assignment. That means that for assignment one, I will have short videos that go over each problem that you want to watch only if you get stuck and only if you felt the pain and the despair, right, and the misery. So first you have to suffer, you really have to try on your own. Of course it's a good idea if you have a work study group and, and then you can watch the videos. I, I will do that for the beginning of the class. So if you go into that folder, so I'm going to post assignment one today. And if you go into that folder, you will find for each problem, like the tutorial, like a video, and I will take you step by step. And remember, assignment is just 20% of the grade. So, you know, the idea is to prepare for the test. So don't jump and look at the answers. I, it, it doesn't, um, won't be good. Okay, is that clear? And then here I will also put like the solutions of the assignments once, once it will be closed. So you can go over them again. I, I do that for uh, solve uh, problems, right? For conceptual questions, you know, you, I, I will let you uh, solve that on your own. Okay, so I just want to go back to here since many of you are going to work on circuit. When I've said here, when I was talking about the history, and I told you that in 1745, it was the beginning of the capacitors, right? The Leyden jar. So it was a way to store charges, and then you can do all kind of experiments, especially if you connect those Leyden jars uh, together. And uh, what I want to emphasize is those Leyden jars are actually the ancestors of the capacitors that we use today. In any electric circuit, you're going to see them. So they are used uh, for RAM, for example, for computer memory, because they can hold the charge. So it could be a one or a zero. They are used for timing. For example, for the pacemaker, it's, using, it's, it's used as a timing device, it's used to smooth out signal, so you remove the noise, so it's, it's everywhere. And it, they come in all kinds of uh, 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 sizes. Of course, back then it was much bigger, but it's the same idea. Okay, and then someone asked me a good question, you know, I went uh, a little bit faster. So this is Alexandro Volta. And he's the one who built the first battery. So remember I told you, if you have zinc here, and then here it was a cardboard that was uh, with salty water, and then you have copper that will produce one volt. And then you keep piling up. That's why it was called peel. Peel means pile in French. So in French, battery is peel. You keep increasing the voltage. And I told you this is the way your battery works. So the battery in your car is supposed to 
produce 12.6 volts. You know, if you walk in your car, you have a digital meter and you want to make sure it's 12.6, otherwise, you know, it's about to die. And you have six cells here, six cells, 2.1 times 6 is 12.6, okay? And I just want uh, to bring something funny, okay? We need, we need funny nowadays. <laughs> so that was Volta. And then you had an amazing scientist, okay? You have to uh, learn about him. He was quite a character. His name was Humphrey Davy. I don't know if he's, maybe uh, it didn't show. Arrange. Okay, Humphrey Davy here, uh, English, Englishman. He, he was not part of the, you know, the, 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 the nobles of the time, but he climbed up. So um, what he had uh, as an idea, he thought that the Volta battery was really hard to deal with because you had cardboard soaked in salt water. And of course, you know, it piled, uh, the, the pile will squeeze out the liquid. So it was not convenient. So he is the one who came up with the ancestor of the car battery that we use today. And instead of salt water, he used sulfuric acid that till this day we are using in, in the car battery. That's why, you know, you don't want them to smoke out. If you see a car battery smoking out, you know, you, you know that you have to run because it is very toxic. And then he came the idea with the idea to connect them all together and to add up the voltage. So he will get amazing voltages because he will connect all those batteries together. So it's like when you have a toy, you have 1.5 and 1.5 and 1.5 and 1.5. That will give you 6 volts, right? You keep piling up. And what he did... Um, he was the one who discovered six elements from the periodic table because he got the idea, like if you take some kind of chemical, you put electricity in, so you put the two lead, positive and negative, you connect to the battery. So I'm going to do experiment uh, with my other class, but this is a battery. So you connect one side and the other side to the solution, and you're going to break down molecules. Right? So, for example, you can break down H2O. So, one side you're going to have hydrogen, the other side you're going to have oxygen. He's the one who did that. He's also the one who came up with the idea the first, first time that the voltage here is so large that you can produce a spark. You can do that with this. You know, if I connect here and I almost touch them and I don't really touch them, you, you make a spark. And so using that spark, they were able to make the first arc lamp. That's, that's how the lamp uh, used to work in public space. And, and it was very, very bright, like a thousand watt. That was before the incandescent lamp. So now for the fun part, okay, we have to laugh. So for the first part, he is the one who used a nitrous what is called nitrous oxide. What, what is nitrous oxide? The laughing gas, right? So nitrous oxide, 50 years after that, was used uh, at the dentist. Actually, you know, I'm so scared of the dentist. I ask, you know, you can still have that. You know, it makes you like, laugh and happy, and then you don't feel anything. And then it was $70, and I said, OK, let's go with a shot. You know, I hate dentists. But, um, well, what he find out is that if you inhale that gas, you, you are high, okay? Basically, you are high. So he organized all these laughing parties, and, and people will inhale that gas, and they will jump up and down, they, and they will be happy. And he became very popular with that. So he was fo so popular, and then he moved to London. London, he came from Cornwall, you know, in England. And, and then he, he's the one who built the Royal Society. And, and then he became a very, very famous public lecturer, a very famous chemist. And he was a very famous ex experimentalist, okay? Maybe one of the best. So you really have to read about him. So 
because he was so high all the time and jumping all the time, you know, uh, what happened is that doing an experiment, he was not very careful. So there was an explosion and he hurt his eyes and that's how he get to hire uh, Michael Faraday that we will talk a lot about him. So fun story. So uh, the, the story doesn't end well because, you know, <laughs> anything you take, benefit and risk. And I guess the risk at some point was higher than the benefit. And it's not funny, but it was so long ago. He died from a lung. He damaged his lungs, right? But, but that, that was the, for the fun story. He also believed he, he, um, in Galvani. Do you remember Galvani? He's the one who um, electrocuted uh, frogs, you know, to see them move. So he tried that too. But he went from frog to, uh, I don't know what that, it, it's a head of a cow, yeah? So I don't know, they had fun with that. It's a little bit creepy. So that, that was for the page here. I thought, you, you can Google that story, okay? It's an amazing story. Laughing gas. You don't need to take the laughing gas. You just listen to disco, you know, it makes you happy and there is no, no risk, no consequence. Okay, so let's go back to where we stopped. Uh, we did that. Here, I want to make things clear. Oh, by the way, we're going to have a pop quiz that will open at 11 a.m., just 10 minutes, right? Or 15 minutes. You can say five minutes more if you want. Just three questions. Example of the question. Here, any charge that you want to build, whether it's positive or negative, it's going to be equals to an integer. Integer means there is no decimals times the charge of a proton or the charge of an electron is going to be the same thing, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulomb. That means that charge is quantized. And for example, if you take uh, some living organism, it's made of cells. Okay, you have one cell, two cells, three cells, four cells. Of course, you cannot have, you know, 4.2 cells, right? Because the 20% of cell, you know, it's not good. So it has to be an integer. When a baby is formed, you have one cell, two, four, two cells, four cells, eight cells. It has to be an integer. Okay, so someone asked me that question. So if I give you an, a, a problem like this, like let's say you want to build another three coulomb, so then that's going to be three equals n times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Okay? Okay, still more fun here, and then we go to the math. We are in static electricities. So it means electricity does not flow. So you, when you have two insulators, so here it's fur or hair, hair is fur, and ebonite. Ebonite is like rubber. You do work on them, okay? You rub them together. You are doing work. That work is going to be used to transfer electrons from the fur to the rubber. It's only electrons that move, okay? Protons don't move. So the electrons are going to leave behind the nuclei that are positively charged. Now, the thing to understand is that once the electrons are here, they are glue. They cannot move because it's an insulator. If you are charging a conductor, like I did, um, no, I didn't do that, like, like the Travolta, John Travolta, you know, the electron will move. Like if, if you say, oh, I don't know. All the electrons will move inside your body and will move outside as far as they can from each other because you are a conductor. But it doesn't work that way for insulator. So it depends on the affinity. So rubber has more affinity for electrons than hair. hair. So same thing, if you blow a balloon, take the balloon, you rub against your hair, the hair is going to lose electrons so they become positive, so the hair repel each other. And uh, the balloon 
will be negatively charged, but only on one side, because the, the, the charge cannot move, right? And then you take the balloon, you put it on the wall, what's going to happen to the balloon? It's going to stick, okay? Why is it sticking? Because it's going to be uh, inducing polarization. So negative side on the balloon, the, the molecules here are going to be polarized, squished, so the plus go this way and it's going to stick to each other. You know, you do that to a cat. If you, want, if you don't like your cat, you, you blow this little balloon, you know, the, the water balloon, right? And you, you rub them, <laughs> it will stick to your cat because cats have fur, so um, they stick to each other. And then you have a cat walking with all those little balloons. It's fun. Not for the cat. But then you make the buzz, right? Now, you can do, instead of using fur, and rubber, instead, you can use silk and glass. So hopefully you will do that uh, next week with, in the lab. So if you take glass and silk is the opposite. That means glass will become positive and silk will become negative. You know silk, the thing that we wear? Silk has more affinity for electrons than the glass. And then you can do all kind of... Uh, Experiment. So I just want to show you, I have an app here. But so if you came late, remember to sign in and to watch the beginning of the class. Physical science. This is very funny. I dream of Ginny. It's a, it was a series in the 60s, 70s, you know. It's very funny. So you always have this idea of grounding, okay? So the, the ground is like a reservoir of charge. So if you are charged or something is charged, you connect it to the ground and you remove the excess of ground. And, and last time I made my point here, just uh, I, I brought a connecting wire, so maybe in uh, two seconds you won't have a teacher anymore. But here you have an outlet, you have two uh, slots here, and one which is round. If I put that in the thing that is round, oh, I don't have round. Oh, here, yeah, here it is. Now if you can see, you have, can, can you testify? You see the thing that is round here? Okay. So if I put that inside, do you testify that I put that inside? Okay. And if I have excess charge, all I have to do is to touch, I'm not dead. Right. So if you are working on a circuit, or if uh, you have too much excess charge, that's what you can do. Okay. You remove your charges. Why, why is it important? Because uh, you can kill your laptop. You have a cheap laptop and you have carpet and, and you, you know, do this. You have excess charge. You touch your laptop. Laptop is connected to the ground. There will be a spark and that can kill all the electronics. So if you work in electronics, for example, if you if you like to work with Arduino, Arduino is my favorite thing. Uh, you you want to ground yourself before. So that's called grounding. Okay, so here, what do we want to do? So this is negatively charged. Rubber love negative charge. This is neutral. And if I bring it this way, that's called polarization. Even though this one was neutral, I'm moving a plus toward the negative away. So it doesn't mean electrons are moving. If it's an insulator, they cannot move. It's just that the molecule gets squished. And so the negative side of the molecule moves this way. Now, if I touch it, you see it becomes negatively charged. The charge cannot move, so they stick, but now they repel each other. So we're going to see that this is a force at distance, and that force is called Coulomb's law. We're going to see it's an inverse square law, so it depends on... Let's say this is Q1, and here I have a charge Q2. 
So we're going to see that the magnitude of the force will be equals to Q1 times Q2. That makes sense. It depends, you know, how much charge are there. And then what's going to happen if you increase the distance? Do you have more force or less force? Less. Very good. So it's going to be inversely proportional to the distance, but to the distance square. Okay, it's called an inverse square law, meaning if you decrease the distance, so you multiply the distance, uh, you divide the distance by two, the force will be multiplied by four. So it works like gravity, but now you also have a constant. Okay, so before we have we had the gravitational constant here, we have the electric constant. And we're going to see that the electric constant is very big. It's like 10 to the 9. So electric force is very big. So that's why if I pull on my finger, you know, I can try very hard. My finger is not going to go, I mean, I'm not going to snap my finger out or my, my arms are not falling. This is because it's the electric force that glue everything together. And the electric force is so much stronger than gravity. It's very easy to defy gravity. Love how strong I am. And if I want to rip my own arm, of course, I cannot do that because electric force is that force that glue everything together. Okay, so everything is glue through electric force. Electric force, if you are going into biomedical field or, or if you want to be a doctor or something like that, so when you study biology, you're going to see it's all electrostatic forces. Okay, so if I do a glass, it will be the opposite. So I rub the glass with a silk. Silk will take electrons plus our left. Now I can touch it. Poof, now it's positive. Okay, so this is called an electroscope, and it's a very old device that was used back then when they were experimenting with uh, electricity. And uh, I'm sure you're going to use that. I think you're going to use that in the lab. So everything is an insulator here. So compared to the previous situation, if you put a charge here, it's not going to stick. Okay, it's not going to stay there. It's going to move, you know, as far as possible from each other. Negative charges hate each other, you know. Electrons hate each other. They don't want to be close to each other. If you do quantum physics, okay, you will learn, or chemistry, you know, you cannot put more than two electrons on the same level. One has a spin down, the other spin up, because they hate each other, okay? They cannot stand each other. So then here... So this, you see polarization is happening. So you have all the plus here because the electrons move as far as possible. And that also has electron. So minus and minus repel each other. Now I'm going to turn And now it's charged. Okay, so it's negative. It's negative here too. So that device was used to measure how many charges are there because you can calibrate it, right? So it means the, if you increase the angle here, uh, that means you have more charges. You can use that also to measure voltage. Okay, so that's how it works. Of course, you can do, I used to do a lot of demo, but I don't have electroscope. Whoops, you see now it's positively charged. So you, you have to imagine that you have positive charges. It's not what's happening. It's just that electrons have left to uh, jump here and to neutralize pluses, but it doesn't matter. You can imagine pluses moving, it's fine. Okay, any question? Okay, so we were here. Of course, you have something called conservation of electric charge. That's one of the fundamental law of conservation. You have conservation of energy, you have conservation of mass, you have conservation of charge, you have conservation of momentum. Okay, so nothing special here. Plus and minus attract, minus and minus repel. So what do you think here?
So when you charge the sphere, what's going to happen? Yeah, they, they're going to rep be repelled, right? Because now they have the same charge, so same charge repel. Okay, a lot of application. I talked about that. That's not a thing, but it was a thing before. That works with electrostatics. A copy machine works with electrostatics. So the way it works is that, you see, you, you recognize the ground here. So that drum here is charged. So you, it's, it's all with semiconductors now. So I think it's silicon or something, selenium. So you have a positive, um, it's, it's positively charged. So that means you took away electrons. So that's the drum. And then here you have like the paper that you are trying to copy. And you shine light. You know, in the copy machine, you see there is a very strong light when you are making your copy. Right? So that light is kicking out the positive charge. That's called the photoelectric effect. It was discovered by Einstein. Light is actually made of photons. Photons can kick out charges. So charges are kicked out everywhere because of the light except here. So you are making a shadow of, of the writing of the three. And then the drum, you know, spin it's go into an ink that's why when you put your hand inside and first of all it, it's very hot so you don't put your hand inside uh, it's heating heated and and then all those little uh, dust particles are going to stick to the plus because of polarization and then you have heat so it will stick to the paper and that's how you make a copy isn't that cool laser works the same way except the laser will kick out the charge as, as you are writing this way. So it's the same idea, it's all electrostatics. If you go to biomed, you know, I think it's a great field. Um, everything is electrostatics beginning with DNA. Okay, the, for example, O has to be with N uh, because, because of that electrostatic force here with hydrogen. Okay, so everything here is the, the, it's, it's when two strands of DNA are attached to each other, it's full electrostatic force. Okay, so electrostatic that is, is very important for the human body, for biology. Okay, so we talk about that. You have material that are conductor and material who are insulator, that are insulator, works like heat. You know, some, some materials are good heat conductors, some are not. So it works the same way. Uh, we did that. So if you have a conductor, if you charge it here, it's called charging by contact. You see that the electrons don't like each other. And it's not a balloon. It's a conductor. And you see that the charges always move on the outside. And I told you that if there is a lightning outside, you know you're going to be safe inside your car because there is no charge inside. It's, it's, not, it's, a, it's called the Faraday's cage, okay? You cannot have an electric field inside and you cannot have a charge inside. Okay, it's a pro protecting cage. If you, as long as you are in the cage, you're fine. Okay, so you can do charging by induction. So in that case, you don't touch it. You see all the plus goes on one side, the minus goes on the other side. Again, it's a conductor, so the charges can move. And then you ground one side. Okay, so you ground one side, can be your finger. You touch, you ground, and then it's positively charged. Okay, so that's called charging by injection. And if you want to go around and, and shock people, there is a device that they developed in the 19th century. It's called an electrophorus. Electrophorus. It's very easy to make. You know, I used to make this. Uh, you have an aluminum plate, you have styrofoam. So what you do is that you have like some plastic here or a table or, or, or glass table works well. You have wool, you start to rub it. So the table, for example, will become negatively charged. 
you have your electrophorus here, which is a conductor. So all the plus uh, goes this side because they want to be with the minus. The minus go on the other side. So what's going to happen if I touch it, if I ground it? I'm going to get rid of what? If I, if I come here and I touch that, very good. I'm going to get rid of the negative. I'm grounding it. So it will be positive. So now I have a charge object. And now I can go around and shock people if you want, right? Or frogs, you know, you have all those cute little frogs outside. You can experiment with them and, and shock them and see what happens. No, I don't want to do that. That would be mean, unless, unless you don't like frogs. But it's a very easy experiment to do. You know, you can make spark. So you, you keep doing this. You, you rub, 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 touch, ground. Rub, 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 rub. rub touch ground and then you build enough charge that if you ask your friend you, you're going to make a spark okay, if you want a spark you want someone uh, with a finger because um, the charge always like like pointy thing you can try the nose too see how it goes it, it cannot kill you okay it's nothing it's not enough charges so if you want to make a video to try okay so this is called polarization okay so that's the very fun thing to play with i used to do demo with that but i don't know here they don't have it's called the van graph generator so it's very cool it's a very cool device so inside here you have a motor so here you have rubber so you have some friction happening so work is done so the charge we split in two at the base, you're going to have negative charge. Here, you have positive charge. The positive charge, you, you have a belt here, so it's moving there. Positive charge are going to be brought here. And of course, they move on the outside. So that's going to be positive. And then there is always those cool experiments that you can do. Example, you ask a student to step on a chair, so the student is isolated from the ground. You touch the electroscope and you see what's going to happen right so it's called a van graph generator and and some some professors are very uh very courageous i'm i'm not very courageous but i used to do it but not not like he's gonna do it and i i just want to make sure you have sound You ready? ready? Are you ready? nervous? So this is a Van Graaf generator. That's a huge one. And it goes to 100,000 volts. It's a huge voltage. But, but it doesn't hold that many charges. So it cannot kill you. Because remember, it's the current that kills. So a Van Graaf generator will be like a capacitor, OK? That will be the plus here, and somewhere here you will have the minus. Sometimes it's grounded. So you have minus here, plus here. It will be a spherical capacitor. See you. So he's isolating himself. So look at the tinsels. And try not to look at me, please. Go ahead. I am now a living electroscope. So what's happening? The charges here, you know, go, gonna go inside his body because he's a conductor, you know, all around. And this is a conductor, so it's gonna be charged too and repelling each other. And he cannot go to the ground. If he steps down, then zing. I don't know if he's gonna. It's it's bad if you have a. <laughs> if the um, if the weather is cooperating today, and if I had long hair, you might even see that my hair would start to act like an electroscope. We can try that too. Why don't you throw it? Is 
it working? Okay, well, this weekend, make sure you take this nylon shirt off in front of the mirror and enjoy, your, enjoy the experiments at home. Don't try this ever. See you Friday. Isn't that cool? So I, I used to do that demo, and of course I would use a student, okay? I would not do it myself. And then the students <laughs> will, uh, will, go, will go and make a human chain. Have you tried that? So the student was here on the table, and then he will grab a hand, and then you will grab a hand, and then you will grab a hand. And each time there was a spark, right? So everyone will get shocked. Um, I, I have found also very good uh, video. What's happening, and that will be an introduction for what's coming up. What you see here is that the electric, um, the, the Van Graaff, like behave, behaves like a huge charge. And because you have a charge, we're going to see, you're going to make an aura around the charge, and we call that the electric field. So it means the space around the charge is going to be modified and you're going to have an electric field, right? So if it's a positive charge, if it's positive charge, the electric field is out. So you have to imagine it's air blowing out, you know, it's like a, a hair dryer. And if it's negative charge, the electric field is in. So it's like a vacuum cleaner, like it goes in. So the space around is going to be changed at the speed of light. And that's what we call an electric field. If we put a charge in that electric field, that charge is going to feel the electric field and is going to respond to it. So it works the same way like the Earth. When we are on Earth, we have, we, we have a mass, obviously. The Earth has a mass. The Earth makes that aura that we call gravity. And obviously, when there is a mass, in the gravitational field, it's going to feel gravity, and it's going to respond by, you know, uh, a force that wants to lower the level of energy. So in that case, you see how it's attracting. So what do you think? Do they have the same charges, or they are opposite charge? Opposite. opposite very good, right? So one will be positive, the other one is negative, and you see that electric field. What it does, it's 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 like a a, a spring that was stretched out and it wants to bring them together to lower the level of energy. So we're going to see that an electric field always wants to lower the potential energy. Plus wants to go with minus, plus and plus hate each other, minus and minus hate each other, right? So that's what the electric field does, it brings them together. They're attracting. It's an attracting force. So that's two charges, and they are the same charge. You see that charge was already moving, so it has some speed, and it comes near another charge, and they both have the same charge. You see that they are both making an electric field. And these two electric fields are interacting with each other, so they repel each other. And uh, attract. Okay, you can do the same thing with the Van Graaff generator. So now they have the same sign. Okay, so now they repel each other. That could be positive, positive. They both produce an electric field, right? The electric field interact to each other. You can see here that uh, that electric field here is zero. And if you have a surface, that will be introducing the next uh, chapter. If you put a surface here, how do we call a, fl a flow? A flow of something that goes for a surface. Start with the F. 
huh? Yeah, it behaves like a fluid, okay? So you have fluid moving through that surface. It's called a flux, okay? So we're going to talk about the flux of the electric field, okay? So it's like how many lines that goes through that surface. And that will take us, that's why I have so many simulations, because in physics, if you don't understand the concept, then the problems become like very challenging. But the, the most difficult uh, topic, you know, students will drop at, at that point is Gauss flow, okay? Because it has to do with flux and electric field. But if you understand the concept, then you don't have to drop, right? So the, the, the concept is like you have a flow, okay? The electric field going through that surface, and that's what we call the flux, okay? Uh, this one is a shot. Boom, they attract each other. So I will uh, introduce the electric field soon. Okay, so let's go to the easy part, Coulomb's law. So if you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, they either attract each other, repel each other. The magnitude depends on the distance and the, 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 the Q1 and the Q2, the product of the charges. Right? So this is called Coulomb's law. So this is in magnitude, because the, the force, it depends on your coordinate system. You know, it could be this way or that way. So it will be a constant. That will be the electric constant times Q1 times Q2 divided by the distance between the charges square. So it's called the inverse square law. Now, the electric constant is very, very big, 9 times 10 to the 9. So when a god decides to make a universe, he or she or whatever it is, it's going to tune all the constants that you find in <laughs> physics, right? So here, the constant for gravity is going to be very small. The constant for electric force is going to be very big. But those constants, you know, will tune how the universe will behave, how nature's law will behave. So here we have a very big constant. And for historical uh, reason, that constant can be re written as, and don't forget the parenthesis, it's very important, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And epsilon 0 is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. So if you do 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, you're going to find 9 times 10 to the 9. And this is called the vacuum permittivity, or epsilon 0. OK, is that clear? It's historical reason, and it's going to come up again for electromagnetism. But for now, we just use 9 times 10 to the 9. So it's an inverse square law. Inverse square law are very important in physics. Gravity works exactly the same. So for example, here, let's say on the surface of Earth, if you are 400 pounds, okay, you multiply the distance by 2, your weight will be divided by 4. So now you are only 100 pounds. It doesn't mean that you lost stuff. Your weight is less. That means gravity is not pulling as hard. If you multiply the distance by 3, your weight will be divided by 9. If you multiply the distance by 4, your weight will be divided by 16. Very good. Okay, it's an inverse square law. Works the same with light. And you can see geometrically why it's that so. Because the surface here depends on the distance square. Like you, you can imagine it's a big sphere here. And the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r square. So you see that the same amount of light here, it's going to be spread out on 4 times the surface area. So if you look at the light here in that little square, you're going to have one fourth. The light will be one nine. Okay, so it works for light. It works for any field. 
Okay, this is a field, it's an electromagnetic field. If you study radiation, radioactivity, radiation, when you have a radioactive decay, you, you're going to have a lot of radiation if you are close, because as you move away from uranium, for example, then the radiation will uh, go down as the inverse square law. Okay, so inverse square law is a very big deal. So if I ask you, for example, two charges, Q1 and Q2, repel each other with a force of 100 newton. So let's say they are not moving, you pin them down. If you divide the distance by two, what's going to be the force? Huh? So you have Q1, no, Q1 here, and Q2, and they attract each other. It's the same force, F1 on 2. It's going to be the same as F2 to 1, because Newton third law, you cannot attract without being attracted. You cannot pull without being pulled. The distance is G, and the force is 100 Newton. Now, if you bring Q2 here, now Q2 is here, what do you, do you think the force is? 400, very good. You divide the distance by 2, the force will be multiplied by 4. That's the idea of the inverse square law. What's going to happen if now you are bringing it twice the distance? So here. What's going to be the force? 25 Newton, very good. You divide by 4. Okay, so you don't need to do all the computation. We know that it's an inverse square law. So that, that uh, constant here was very important to find, and it was found by Coulomb, although they, they have controversies. You know, he's not sure that he took the idea from someone else, but it happens a lot, you know. So anyway, the way he did that, you have a charge here. Let's say it's uh, positive, and then you have a negative charge here. But here, it's connected by a torsion spring, you know, a, a torsion. So something, a spring that you can, you can uh, rotate like this. You have some resistance, right? So it's going to be attracted. Minus will be attracted to plus. And we, we can find out by how much the thing moved, rotate, and we find the constant. So that was done by Coulomb's French. Uh, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, at least I know that I got that pronunciation right. So it was late century, uh, 18th century. So, okay, try to do this one. Okay, so I'm going to write. So I, uh, sorry for the people online, you know. Here, maybe you're going to see. So the force, okay, that's something that you use a lot in engineering. So it's, it's important for you to understand. So this one doesn't work anymore. But it's Q1, Q2, D squared. So what, what, what do they ask? The charge particle attract each other with force F. If the charge of both particles is double, that means you, put, you do it this way. Multiply by 2, multiply by 2. And then the separation between them is also double. Okay, so that means that distance is multiplied by 2. That means that d square, yeah. 8? 8? B? Yes, yes, yes. B, B is correct, yeah? Okay, because the distance square is going to be multiplied by 4, right? Uh, No. Wait, what yeah, C. Yeah. C. Okay, because then you have 2 times 2 is 4 <coughs> divided by 4 is 1. Okay? So it's going to be uh, the same thing. Right? So for this kind of problem, write down whatever you have here. So it's going to be uh, 2 times 2. Okay, you will be right if it was not square. But because it's square, the 2 becomes 4. So 4 divided by 4 is 1. Okay, so you write the answer is C. 
Okay, so now that's the Bohr model. I mentioned him. That was the first model that they got. The idea is that the atom works like a solar system. The, 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 the proton or the nucleus is at the center and the electrons orbit. And it doesn't work that way since we have uh, quantum physics, you know, it doesn't really work that way, but it was a, a good model to begin with. And that was the first model of the atom, the Bohr model, it's called. And so the electron goes around, and, and you see the speed here is the same. So it doesn't speed up. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, go faster around. It's moving at a constant speed. But if you remember from physics one, it has a centripetal acceleration. Remember from inertia, the electron wants to keep in a straight line at a constant speed. No, you can't. So there is a centripetal force pulling it in, keep it in on track. And that acceleration is V squared over R. So you're going to have the force here in the centripetal force equals mass because it's Newton's second law, V squared over R. Okay, so from physics one. So try, try to do that. Uh, help each other, talk to each other. You, you, can, you can talk to each other and uh, help each other if you want. Okay, you can you can help each other. Try to do it. The time it takes me to set up. So the mass of the electron, the mass of the electron is given in one uh, previous slide. So the mass, the mass of the electron is nine point. One, I think, times 10 to the negative 31 kilo. That's the mass of an electron. Okay, the mass of a proton and the, uh, not sorry, the, 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 the charge of a proton and the charge of an electron, they are the same. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulomb except the electron is negative, the proton is positive. But they have the same charge in magnitude, okay? What else do you need? The electric constant is 9 times 10 to the 9, whatever you need here. So try to do it like more you do here, less you have to do at home. So we have the force is K Q1 Q2 divided by the distance square. Okay, and that will be equals to mass times acceleration. 
And the acceleration, when it's a uniform circular motion, is always v squared over r. So v squared over r. And then it's always easier if you write the algebraic expression first to see if we can cross out stuff. And in that case, we can. We can cross out stuff. You can isolate v squared. Okay, you divide by m, so k, q1, q2, over m, r. And then you can take the square root on both sides. So let me know. So be careful with the ti. So we have 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 here. You have a square. By the way, if you love math, you know you can take this one out of the square root. Make, uh, help me make, make sure I don't do mistake. I do a lot of mistake. And then here you have the distance which is uh, given. Okay, let me know what you get, and I'll tell you if it's right. Is that right or no? It's just you plug it in. You don't have to do it this way. I like to play with algebra, but you don't have to do that, okay? You can first find whatever the force is, and then you say it's equal to mv squared over r, you isolate v. Uh, it's, it's the thing here. Yeah. Okay, maybe I should have make it clear. This is a proton because it's hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton and one electron. It does not have neutron. Just plus, a plus here and a minus here. That's hydrogen. If you add the neutron, then you have something called deuterium, which is heavy water that was used to make the atomic bomb. But nothing, no connection here. I'm just taking a tangent. So this is a proton. This is the electron. And the electron wants to move in a straight line at the constant speed. No, you can't. So it's going around. Okay. The distance here is given. And you have the mass of the electron here. Right? And there will be a force. It's, it's like a planet orbiting the sun. You can do that too. You can do that. But here they ask for the speed. But if you... Where is my thing? You, you can do that too. You can first solve for the force. And then you can solve for the speed. You can do that. Just because I like to do algebraic stuff, but you can do that definitively. You can solve for the force, then you write it's equals to mv squared over r. So that's a hydrogen atom. So you have a proton. I'm going to put a p here. That's proton. And around there, you have an electron here. I'm going to put an e here for electron. And there is a Velocity here. It wants to keep going in a straight line at a constant speed. No, you can't. Right? There is a force pulling in. And that force here is the electric force. Okay, that, that will be the electric force here. That is the electric force here. And because of Newton's second law, F equals MA, then the electric force is the mass of the electron times the, the acceleration. And we learned that in a circular motion, the acceleration is always v squared over r. And it has, it's also in this direction here. And you have a mass here. So it works like a planet. Okay? It's like a planet around the sun of if you... If remember last semester, like if if you have a car, 
and you have a car making a curve. So the car is uh, making that curve here. The car wants to go in a straight line at a constant speed. No, you can't. Hopefully, you have friction pulling you in. Okay, that's called the centripetal force. And lucky for you, because otherwise, off tangent you go. If, if it's icy, you know, you lose control and you are not keeping, stay on the track. Okay, so we go here. Can we, any, any more questions? Negative one? Here, 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11. So what did you find? Very good. Okay, if, if you need help, you know, I can show you step by step. Otherwise, that's the answer. Yes or no? You want me to show you with the TI or we good? Don't be shy. So with the TI, remember that when you use scientific notation, I say it once, I don't know, because some people were not here with me, so, but you do 9, and then you use here, second comma, that will be your best 10. Okay, you go so much faster like this, 1.6, second comma, and whatever, minus 19, and then you square that, okay, and then, and then you can go step by step, so then you divide also by the square root of, and then you have 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 times 5.29, second comma, that will be the best 10, minus 11 if I didn't do any mistake. Um, I'm missing uh, maybe a parenthesis here. Uh, no, I must have done a mistake. What did I do? Which one? Is that correct or no? That that equation here. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. So what did I do here? You just, you just the, uh, oh, I didn't square it. Oh, I didn't square it. So here you have to square it. Okay. You want me to do that again, or you good? Good. You, you, the best way to do it maybe is to square before. So you do 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and then you square it. Okay, that will be safe. And then you multiply by 9 times 10 to the 9, enter, and then you divide by 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31, and it has to put parentheses. Okay, I'm not going to do it, but yeah. takes forever on, on the computer. Okay, and then you divide by 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, almost there. And then you do the square root. You call back the answer here. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so maybe the best way is to do it step by step. I forgot to, I mean, the, the 2 didn't square it. Is that clear? Okay, so that's a big speed. And just if I ask you what's the, uh, compare that to the speed of flight. So the speed of flight is 3 times 10 to the 8. So what is V over C? I want to have the ratio between that speed, okay, 10 to the 6, and then I divide by the speed of flight. 
nothing can go faster than the speed of light and if something goes like that fast you have to use special relativity you get 0 0.007 so 1 2 it's about 0 0.7 percent the speed of light did you get that okay so it's it's quite fast okay so let's do something else now my point is remember when you had two masses they attract each other because of the gravi gravitational force from Newton, it's a universal um, gravitational law, and you see that it's the same expression, except instead of having Q1, I have M1, instead of having Q2, I have M2, except of having the distance, uh, I still have the distance square. So I would like you to find the force from that okay it's already there so you have the electric force now we want to find what is the gravitational force between them okay so gravity are pulling them together because you have the mass of the proton the mass of the electron so they attract each other what's going to be that force so we can compare huh so we, we, got, we can compare both forces, right? So just, just compute this. So that will be the force between the two masses. So that's going to be the proton. That's going to be the electron. The distance is going to be the same. So the distance is the same. Gravity constant is 10 to the negative 11. You have the mass of the electron, the mass of the proton, plugging in. So we can compare the two forces. Do you understand what to do? You just plug it in. If you have any question, let me know. So we, we found the electric force. It's in the previous slide. Uh, now we want to find the gravitational force because they, they have masses, so they attract each other. So the electric force is 9 times 10 to the 9, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. We did that just, just now. And that distance here, that was 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newton. So we did that before. Now we want to find the force of gravity, which is, now we use that constant here, uh, 1.67. So do that, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 11. The mass of a proton is, where is the mass of a proton? Ah, here, you write. 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. That's the mass of an electron, which is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. And the distance is the same. And I forgot to square. I forgot to square. That's, and that's a G. So what do you get? Very good. Uh, 9, 8 times 10 to the negative 48. Okay, so that's why at an uh, atomic level, we're going to neglect gravity. Okay, we're, no, we're going to neglect the weight of the electron relative to the proton, the force of attraction, because this number is really big compared to that number. Is that clear? And if you do the ratio, okay, if you do electric divided by gravity, 
to that ratio. Yeah, that force here. Yeah? So you, you divide the electric force by the gravitational force, which is 9.98 times 10 to the negative 48. Make sure you use parentheses when you're using your TI. If you need help with the TI, I can help you after the class. So what do you get about... Very good. Who said that? Right? So it's about 10 to the 40. It's a ratio. That means the force, the electric force, is 10 to the 40 greater than gravity. That's why my arms are not falling down, because gravity are pulling on them. But it's a joke compared to the electric force that glue my arms together because all the molecules, you know, they, they are electrically bound to each other. So the way it works is that electric force is greater, so much greater than gravity. Is that clear? Any question? If, if you are too shy to ask and you want me to help you after the class, I can help you. Now, I have a question for you. Ready for the question? Okay, so you have, for example, the sun, and this is the earth. So when we study, for example, the, the, the orbits of planets or stars around each other, how come we only consider gravity and not the electric force? Very good. So there is, it, it means it's neutral, right? There is no charge, right? What did you say? You know, I, I, you have to speak up. What happened? My son drives me to campus and he blasts this music. And after that, I cannot hear for uh, at least two hours. What is listening? Music? Yeah. I don't understand that music. It's not my music. <laughs> my music is the 80s. My watch stopped. Okay? My watch is in the 80s. Right? I, I don't understand the young people music. I, I like Donna Summer. I like, you know, Don't Worry, Be Happy, you know, those kind of music, but not, not the modern music. Except, except Stromae. I don't know if you know Stromae. Okay, I love that. That's my son who introduced that to me, but otherwise that, no, not my thing. So anyway, uh, so gravity here is uh, very strong because it's neutral. And that means you have as many pluses that you have minus, you have plus and minus, so it's neutral, this is neutral. And, and it has a big mass here, the mass is huge. So of course, if you keep building up small stuff, you know, it's like someone who goes to the dollar store. So, you know, one dollar is cheap, one dollar is cheap, and then one dollar is cheap. But at the end, you know, it builds up. So, same thing here. Gravity is very strong on, on a big scale because it's not charged. Okay? Okay. So now I just want to remind you about adding vectors from last semester. When, when you add vectors, remember, you, you look at the x component and the y component. And, and of course, if you take calculus, maybe two or three, maybe it's calculus three. You know about uh, adding vectors. Calc 3? Calc 3 is easier than Calc 2, no? Calc 2 is very hard. So you have one vector.
So adding vectors is just, if it's in one dimension, you just do whatever is to the right minus whatever is to the left. Now, if it's in two dimensions, so for example, I have this vector, and it's always good, for example, you can attach them by, let's say I don't want that one. Okay, so you have two vectors here. Let's say you have these two vectors and you want to add them up. You move one on top of the other one, so tail to head. And to find the sum, you connect the tail of the first one to the head of the second one. And that will be about that. So, of course, you don't do geometry anymore because, you know, you are not going to go around with a protractor and, and graph paper. We used to do that before, but you don't do that except for lab. But you see that the X component of the resultant of the sum equals the X component of the first plus the X component of the second. You see that, right? So x component of the first plus x component of the second. The y component will be the y component of the first plus the y component of the second. So I can, I can make it this way. Okay, you see that to find the y component, you add the y component of the individual vectors. Any question? If, if it's uh, something new, you know, you can uh, look at adding vectors. Okay, so let's add vectors here. You have a charge Q1, Q2, Q3, and they don't move. They give you the charges, and they want to find the magnitude on Q1. So the first thing you do you decide which way is plus, which way is minus. The second thing, you want to make a drawing. So for example, this is plus, this is minus. So Q1 is going to be attracted to Q2. So you're going to have a force going this way. You see that this one has a larger charge. It's negative. So plus and minus attract. And then it's just uh, algebra. Okay, so why don't you try to do that? You, you can help each other. And remember, I post, I, I, I will post a lecture. So if you, if you need to review. So you have a force here and a force there. So it's good to have like subscript here, one to two and one to three. So you can find F net is whatever is to the right minus whatever is to the left. So it's going to be F13 minus F12. From last semester. And then the best way to do it, so you do that on one side of a paper and then you find the magnitude. So everything is clean. So try to do it, F12, so you have the charge, so it's just the magnitude, right? Micro, remember, it's 10 to the negative 6, so 3 times 10 to the negative 6, and then the distance square.
So the just to remind you that the magnitude of the force is ti 9 times 10 to the 9 Q1 Q2 over the uh, distance square. So first you always find the magnitude of the force and then you worry about cosine or sine but that will be easier if you do that so you can divide your paper in two, two uh, sides right on one side you find the magnitude and then on the other side you're going to add the components so did you find this one Did you find it? Huh? 2.7, very good, yeah? 2.7. And this one? Very good, 8.4, very good. So that would be the magnitude. Once we have the magnitude, you move to the other side. And that will be 8.4 minus uh, 2.7. So 5.7. And then you make a drawing. Okay, so it's positive. So I forgot to tell you that first thing you do, you decide which one is plus, which one is minus. And then you can do a drawing, Q1. So the net force will be here. Is that clear? And then from here, if the charge is not pin, you can find the acceleration. Because if there is a force, there is an acceleration. So you can find that the acceleration is the force divided by the mass, and you could find the acceleration if you want. Okay? Oh, someone, who, who has issues with the book? Someone is going to help me. Daniel, is Daniel here? Yeah. Okay. At 11:30, someone is going to help me. I don't know why, because the, you see the text only from last semester, like from chapter one to 20. That's what's happening. Okay. Hopefully, it's going to be fixed today. He's he's going to help me. He's going to take over my laptop and uh, help me. Okay. By, by the way, we we. Uh, we don't have class on Monday, right? And and well, it doesn't matter for us, you know. You don't have class on Monday. I don't have astronomy on Monday. Now you see here, I told you that you should get the book, even if it's an older version. If you get the book through the canvas, I'm 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 gonna try to fix that. But then they, you have tutorial, like live tutorial. Otherwise, the old edition is fine. But you see here, I put textbook 21.2, 21.3 to do. So it means you have to do it. I don't collect, but it's a good idea. I try. So, so that's why you, you study as we go along. Okay. In, in three minutes, uh, I think hopefully the pop quiz is going to be open. So make sure you have your canvas, whatever, open. It's it's open not uh, with calculus. And and there is no makeup for the pop quiz. So if you are online, don't ask me to have a makeup. Okay, you can take it online if you want, but there is no makeup. Because it's only five.